So I'm going to stop here because I want to try to make time first for a, a conversation I'm greatly looking forward to with Brett Carter, who is president of Duke System, Power Systems North Carolina. But then I also want to make sure that Brett and I both make some time for your questions and comments back to us. So at this point, I want to invite Brett to join me on stage for a conversation. Unrehearsed, by the way, live. I have to uh, tell you, in my experience, um, so you want me to take this one you, please, yeah, the one on the left, <laughs> except it's on the right for them. So you, maybe it's better. I don't know. Um, you know, a lot of CEOs with whom I have worked would never do this. They would want a briefing book. They would want to be have a script. They would know want to know exactly what was going to happen. So I want to just one more time say to Brett, thank you for joining me thank you. For, for this conversation. So the idea of folks who were uh, moderating this conference was to kind of, first of all, hear from a business person, hear their reactions to kind of things we've just been talking about, get their sense of what's important in education, and uh, a sense of how we can bridge this gap. I will tell you, I think the world of education and the world of business are, are deeply separated and divided. They are oil and water. And all too often, they don't like, trust, or respect one another in a general sense. So the conversations like this are important and informative for many reasons. So let's start. Uh, first of all, reactions to what you just saw, the seven survival skills, the, 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 the culture of innovation versus the culture of schooling. What, what, what stood out for you, Brett? I'll, I'll just say that, um, that I think the things that, that stand out in my mind, um, uh, especially when I reflect on the things that you've mentioned, is that our, our kids are growing up in a completely different environment than, than we grew up in, and, and the traditional uh, uh, learning uh, methods. I, you know, I can't imagine. I have, I have a nine-year-old that is um, using technology that I thought was far, far reaching when I was watching the Jetsons as a kid. <laughs> so now, no, and so now he's he's holding a handheld device and he's talking to his cousins in Tennessee and in Atlanta and in Pittsburgh, um, and and he's seeing them live. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, how can a teacher hold this kid's attention? Right. Um, so I think that when you start talking about getting away from the traditional uh, methods of, of teaching, we have to do that. And, and I'll, I'll just say the last thing you mentioned is that the, there, there's been a separation between business and uh, the education system. Uh, I know at Duke Energy, we've been striving to bridge the two. The, the private-public relationship um, is so important to the success of our education system. And you know, when I think about what teachers make, um, and I think about the importance of teachers to the survival of our country, I think we've, we've, we definitely have some, some, uh, some mismatches going on. Yeah. So as you think about the skills that are most important, mm -hmm. what, what, you, what you're looking for when you're hiring, what are, what are the ones that you see as most important, and what do you see as the most glaring gaps? Well, I, I think about the, the technical capability of, of the students today, and, and you know, you talked about the innovation. Um, our business is threatened uh, on a daily basis. Uh, not three years ago, we had about one-tenth of one percent of our entire system uh, was uh, made up of solar generation. Um, we're now calculating that by 2020, we'll have about 4,000 megawatts of, of solar generation on our system, of which we may not own a lot of that mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we're not able to make the transition uh, from, and you talk about the speed of, of technology, if we're not able to make that transition from having one-tenth of one percent of our system uh, uh, being uh, powered uh, through solar to about 15%, being made up of solar generation and getting that right, uh, we can go the route of the landline uh, telephone. And so uh, we're looking for folks that have the entrepreneurial spirit to come into our business, uh, create new ways for us to uh, uh, operate, our oper operate our business. And, and so we've split our business into a regulated and into an unregulated um, hmm. mode. Hmm. And what we're finding is that it's, it's difficult for the regulated uh, employees to make that transition to the unregulated. And so 
there's a whole new recruitment pattern that we're, that we're taking on. So now you're really trying to deliberately hire people who would work better in a less regulated system where they have to be more entrepreneurial Absolutely. and take more initiative. Absolutely. That's if, very interesting. And, and you think, um, you know, this, this past year we, we, um, we had a, what we would consider to be a successful uh, a year for the company, but what really happened was our unregulated business or our commercial business provided a lion's share of the, of, of the income for, mm -hmm. for our operations. Um, so there's a higher return on, on that investment than absolutely the higher return and uh, it's moving much faster. Yeah, I had a, I had two meetings yesterday. Uh, one was with uh, uh, the president of the Commerce Chamber of Commerce in Germany. Uh, they have seventy thousand businesses in this Chamber of Commerce, and they're trying to figure out ways to um, innovate their their business operations as they go through decommissioning of nuclear plants, et cetera. Uh, in the afternoon, I signed a, a memorandum of understanding with uh, Invest Sao Paulo. Um, and that memorandum of understanding is a <coughs> shared knowledge uh, of, of new technologies in the energy space, et cetera. And I started to realize very quickly that most of my meetings yesterday were made up of, of uh, meetings with countries that, you know, were uh, trying to compete in a, in a completely different world. And in a lot of ways, the, the advantages that they have is that they don't have the structure that we have, mm -hmm. and which, which is interesting because the, the president of Invest Sao Paulo said, well, we, we lack infrastructure, but we think that that's a way for us to leapfrog right. the U.S. Right. Um, and if we can't break down the structures that we've built over the years, I think we're, we're going to be in, uh, you know, in, a, in a pretty heavy fight with some of these uh, up and coming mm -hmm. Uh, countries and and these the, the youth that they have don't have the same boundaries and when you talk about passion <laughs> they they have a fire in their belly yeah. and um, and in a lot of ways that makes up for a lot of the uh, uh, the classical training that we're giving our students so what do you see as some of the biggest gaps or, or deficiencies in in the young people who come to to uh, uh, interview at Duke what, you know, what's missing it, it's 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 the um, it's that that innovative spirit. It's the you know I think I think that when I talk to uh, the students that are coming out today, in a lot of ways they're looking for a job, and um, right now we're looking for solutions. And oh, that's um, interesting. Uh, they're looking for a job. You're looking for ideas. Yes, we are. You're I mean, looking for new strategies. That's absolutely right. Which is not just a job. Yeah, and uh, you know as I as I read your your book and I, I read uh, the article in the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was thinking about my own 17 year old daughter who, who graduates from high school this year. And um, it, I remember when we introduced her to music at, at, age, at the age of five and she started playing piano. And I watched her completely transform uh, from this shy little girl to wanting to write her own music, wanting to write her own songs. Now she's, um, she won the state debate championship in the 10th grade. She's, she's just, and so we're trying to figure out how we continue to introduce those types of outside learnings right. to our other children so that, um, so that they can experience that same feeling of freedom. Yeah. And, and I think that's the part that's missing is that uh, a lot of our students don't feel the freedom to be able to express themselves uh, because I think there's a fear that if they deviate from the mean, that there's mm -hmm. a punishment mm -hmm. uh, that goes along with that. And, and um, I always felt from my upbringing that um, I could never fall as far as I had come. So I, I always threw, threw risks to the wind and, mm. and just, mm. I mean, I always wanted to be in the losing company because, uh, and, and that, that played out well for me because I always thought that, hey, if there was, if there was anything to gain, it would be on a, on a losing team. That's fascinating because we, we often assume that you know these kids have gotten straight A's or are really kind of destined to, to promising futures but you're saying they need some setbacks they need to be on a losing team the idea is that you have to struggle differently you have to see the world differently than if you're already in a highly successful organization is that right I, I think I think that's right I mean when when I was I worked for a, a utility called Aquila and uh, I, I really felt that I got my big break when uh, there was a company that we had purchased that was losing uh, tens of millions of dollars a year 
and um, they were looking for folks to go over there. And, and uh, uh, there, most people were just like, nah, I'm gonna just stay right here. I'm comfortable uh, with, with a profitable engine. And I, I wanted to go. So I relocated my family uh, to, that, to that company. And I learned more from all of what we were doing wrong and the mistakes that we were making about our industry than I did staying in the very stable and successful sure. utility business that was yeah. back at our headquarters. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to want your kid to fail. I mean, you know, the last thing I want to tell any of my kids, I have three kids, is that, you know, hey, go out, make mistakes, you know, go, <laughs> go out and, you know, and if my 14-year-old ever heard you say, you know, F is a new A, he'd bite off on that. <laughs> I'd never He's ready for that new that. report exactly. card. Exactly. <laughs> uh. But it's, it is, it's, hard to, it's hard to want to watch them fail, especially when you've experienced that. You know that failure doesn't feel good. I don't no, care. It yeah, I mean, it, it, when you step away from it right. and you look back, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, but in the middle of it, it's not fun. Exactly. In the middle of it, you feel like, you feel like a failure for some reason. You know what? Yeah, there is that. Um, you know, I love that word iteration. For me, that begins to change the whole idea of what is, in fact, failure. Failure is learning. That's right. That's but right. Th we have that, you know, the, the F goes with the word failure, and that, that's hard to separate. But I was going to go in a different tack here. You know, one of the things I'm finding fascinating, and this was my experience in interviews with executives for the last book, the assumption of many educators, and I began probably my career with this assumption, is that what corporations want are widgets. And that our job is to, you know, if we were to think about, you know, educating people for work, what that really means is educating them to be compliant, orderly, on time, yeah. that, all that kind of 50s and 60s stuff. But you're really saying, as many of the others I've interviewed, that that's simply no longer true. That, in fact, that's, a, that's an impediment to have employees like that. Is that and, right? You know, it, it, and I'm, I'm going to give you that, an analogy. We, we built our own nuclear plants. Uh, in North and South Carolina with our own employees. Um, cutting edge technology that now powers this state with some of the low cost, uh, lowest cost energy in the entire country. And so uh, if, if you read the Observer about Charlotte being the fastest growing city of over a million uh, uh, people in the last 10 years, they've added more jobs than any other city in the United States. Uh, we, we like to think that we've contributed to that What's amazing is that the nuclear plants that were built 30 years ago are not the same plants that are operating today. Mm. The nuclear plants that we built 30 years ago had about a 70% uh, capacity factor, which means that for out of 100% of the days, they operated 70% of those days. Mm. Today, those plants generate 96 to 99% efficiency from a capacity factor perspective. Mm. The, the people that built the plants continued to train, brought new 